Professor Johnson, how does a lawyer's perspective help in evaluating scientific theories? And aren't you a bit out of your element? Well, if I'm out of my element, then uh, Charles Darwin must also have been out of his element because his uh, training was in uh, medicine and uh, theology, although he was, in fact, a very good scientist, uh, self-taught, a gentleman amateur like others of his time. Charles Lyell, the father of modern geology, was a lawyer. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the thing about Darwinian evolution today is that it is a general philosophical concept that connects many disparate fields of science. So that you see, uh, molecular biologists, for example, are relying on fossil experts, paleontologists, and vice versa. And then they're all relying on geneticists. And each one of these groups of scientists outside their own element is just a generalist, is just a, a layman like, like anyone else. Uh, so there aren't really any specialists in evolution. It's a generalist's country. What a lawyer brings to this, or an academic lawyer who is uh, uh, philosophically oriented, is a nose for the, the assumptions, the patterns of thinking, the things that, as members of a particular professional culture, the, the people just take for granted and never question. Uh, for example, one of those things is the creative power of natural selection. If you ask these people, how do you know that mutation and selection, the Darwinian mechanisms, have the power to create complex organs, the answer will, they give will be some variation on, well, everybody knows that. That's common knowledge. We settled that long ago. All of these things that say, we've just decided not to think about that, but simply to assume it. So th that's what a lawyer brings to this, is the ability to recognize things like that and bring them out in the open. And that's, of course, why the outsider is so unpopular with the insiders. Because the outsider is saying, look, uh, here's where you went wrong. This is the assumption you made that was never established, and that because you couldn't establish it, you agreed to treat it as a fact among yourselves, and then to use your authority to prevent anybody from criticizing it. Well, naturally, the professional group doesn't want to hear that. And so they hate outsiders, uh, as uh, they properly should, I, I suppose, because they, they blow the whistle on this. Um, the other thing to be said about the outsider uh, is that every one of the great authorities of Darwinism, from Charles Darwin and T.H. Huxley at the beginning, through Dobzhansky, Simpson, and Julian Huxley a generation ago, to Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Dawkins, and so on today, uh, is that every one of those authorities wrote books for the general public. They address the general public, and not a single one of them ever said, this evidence is inaccessible to you. Don't try to figure it out because you can't understand it. Indeed, the implied premise of all the books was, it's easily understood. And anyone who isn't completely prejudiced or ignorant can see that it's obviously true. So, I like to think of myself as the reader for whom all those books were intended, and I'm speaking back to the authors and explaining to them what they overlooked. That in fact, their books are not convincing because they're assuming at the beginning of the inquiry the point that they claim to have demonstrated at the end, and so there's a thinking flaw. Um, so instead of responding to that, naturally they say, oh, why don't you shut up um, and leave us alone uh, so we can continue to get away with this. Why are you convinced that Darwinism is more philosophy than science? Darwinism is science insofar as it is used at the level at which it really works empirically, and that's the micro level. Darwinism is a scientific explanation for why you get offshore island species that differ somewhat from species on the mainland. And uh, there it's, it's a fruitful research program, um, it's plausible, it's uh, up to a point uh, can be demonstrated, although even there only up to a point I'm afraid, but it's, it's legitimate good science. Now Darwinism becomes philosophy when you make the extrapolation and say that's how we get things in the first place. The great example of that would be that um, there was a scientific hypothesis that in periods where the trees of a forest were darkened by industrial smoke, uh, moths which were dark in color would be better able to survive because the birds wouldn't be able to see them, and um, light-colored moths would be eaten more often, and so for a time you would get more dark moths and fewer light moths in a population. 
and some observations were done which seemed to confirm this. Now that's perfectly good science, and it explains why when you have a population of light moths and dark moths both present in the population, you'll get more light moths at one time and more dark moths at another. Darwinism's perfectly good for explaining things like that. But when you take that evidence and you say, and that tells us how we got trees and moths and birds and scientific observers in the first place, that's pure philosophy. The amount of science in it is negligible. And of course, that's what's important about Darwinism. Nobody really cares all that much why you have more light and dark moths other than people whose professional mission is to study that. What the population wants to know is, how did we get here? And when the Darwinists try to answer that, it's pure philosophy. Have any of your critics acknowledged that Darwinism is something akin to a secular religion? I had the honor to be the subject of a program at the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science annual meeting in Boston in February of 1993. Michael Ruse gave a, a lecture on me, which uh, was intended to, to be, from its uh, abstract, a, uh, an exercise in what we might call Johnson bashing. Um, but uh, what he did was really very surprising. He, in fact, um, uh, confessed uh, that I was right on the main issue. The main issue is that what they call evolution, that is naturalistic evolution, metaphysical naturalism, is founded on a highly debatable and controversial uh, philosophical program. And that it's been used as a religion by evolutionists from the beginning. Ruse cited T.H. Huxley and his grandson Julian Huxley, as well as other figures, were saying that what they're really doing is using this as a cultural platform as a religion in all but name. It functions as a religion for them. Now then he said, of course, we should acknowledge this among ourselves as academics because we're sophisticated, we want to talk about the truth, but we would not admit this to a school board, uh, or, or, nor would we admit it in court, you see. And of course, that's what happens. The, I've, I've been observing this for years. The sophisticated people in the universities know that this is founded on philosophy. But because it's their philosophy, you see, they think that's fine. And because they have contempt for the public, um, they think that it's all right to mislead the public through you know, propaganda uh, because the public doesn't really deserve to know the truth. After all, they're not intellectuals like we are. And so we can say anything we want to them. That is a widespread attitude. And I give Michael Ruse credit for admitting it in public, uh, uh -huh, that that is, in fact, what's uh, uh, going on. So it was, it was marvelous, uh, uh, of course, for me to... Um, hear the tape of this uh, public meeting, uh, and I hope every school board and every uh, judge in the United States becomes aware that when they get testimony about this from representatives of the scientific establishment, they're getting something which is very different from what these people say to each other in private. It's the public story. They keep two sets of books, in a word. You describe yourself as a creationist. What do you mean by that term? A creationist is a much distorted term. In the media usage and in the propaganda usage of the scientific establishment, it means only a believer in literal genesis. And it, that's then a term for ridicule. So the, the, the propaganda message is that everybody that doesn't agree with us is over in that other camp, and then we'll talk about Noah's Ark and so on and, and ridicule it, and we'll be able to get rid of them. But in um, the proper usage, a creationist is simply somebody who believes in the existence of a creator. That would be something like 85% of the American public, maybe even more. Um, uh, that is to say, the creator may have created uh, recently and suddenly, or may have created over a very long period of billions of years through a gradual process. That's a question of detail. Um, the important point is that a purposeful intelligence was doing the creating by whatever uh, method. Uh, so that what the um, scientific establishment tends to do is to say that, well, first place, we'll put everybody in that group into a very narrow box, and then we'll dispose of them by ridicule. And then having got rid of all our enemies by that set of language tricks and propaganda mechanisms, we'll say the only thing left is us, so everybody is supposed to believe the way we do. That's what they call the scientific method these days, and it's just a, a, a very reprehensible kind of propaganda. What is meant by the term evolutionist? 
Again, uh, uh, you see, that's a term that can be given many meanings, and it is given many meanings. Um, if it meant only a person who believed in evolution in some sense, then everybody would be an evolutionist. There would be no such thing as a non-evolutionist, because everybody believes that you breed dogs and you get different breeds of dogs. Um, and so, uh, in fact, the Darwinists will say, well, since you believe in that, you believe in evolution, you're an evolutionist, you're just like us, you know, uh, everybody agrees with us, don't they? This is part of the double talk. Now, I think what an evolutionist really is, in the sense in which that term is used in our educational system, is that it is a metaphysical naturalist. Now, th that means uh, an adherent to the philosophy of naturalism, which says that nature is a closed system of material causes and effects, which can never be influenced by anything from outside, specifically by a supernatural creator. There is no God, or if there is a God, he stays back there before the Big Bang and has nothing to do with us, and uh, so we can ignore a God. It's really more God is irrelevant than that God is non-existent. Uh, that's the basic uh, idea of naturalism. So it's all up to us. Um, we are in, uh, our bodies are created by natural selection and mutation, the Darwinian mechanisms, but then from that point on, it's all up to us. We can make up whatever values we want to. Um, and of course, they evolve and change as we want them to do in, in, in each generation, so we're fundamentally free and liberated. That is what I would call an evolutionary naturalist, which is what evolutionist comes to mean in our society. Do you consider theistic evolution to be a contradiction in terms Theistic evolution is a contradiction in terms as the words are used in our society. It isn't an inherent contradiction in terms because a creator, God, could create by a process of gradual development which we might call evolution. The problem with that formulation is that it isn't what evolution means in the scientific culture. In the science uh, culture, in the science education culture, evolution means a purposeless material mechanism, you see. So it isn't being used to further a purpose or it wouldn't be evolution. So the people who call themselves theistic evolutionists have either missed this or have decided to blind themselves to it. You see, they talk about evolution as if it just meant a gradual process that a creator could use in furtherance of his purpose. Um, and to people who know, don't know any better, that sounds logical. Uh, but what they don't realize or don't tell their audiences is that that isn't what the science education world means when it uses the term evolution. They mean something that has no purpose um, and that excludes the creator by definition. So as used in our culture, theistic evolution is, as they say, an oxymoron, a self-canceling, incoherent term. Um, and uh, as a result, it's used primarily to lull the theists, Christians, Jews, or whatever, um, into acquiescence. You see, don't worry about it, because we can make these two things uh, consistent. Well, in fact, the people who really control science education are laughing at that, because they know that, in fact, at, at a deeper level, evolution, as they mean to teach it to everybody's children, is not compatible with theism in any meaningful form. Remember those words, factual reality, you say, that um, uh, Stephen Jay Gould uh, uh, used uh, when he was debating with me in print. Everything that is in factual reality is natural, is material, is within the ken of science. What's outside of science is imaginary. It's subjective. Belief in God exists in your head. God exists as an idea in your head. God as a separate reality outside of science, and therefore outside of reality. People shouldn't let themselves be deceived about this point, uh, be, because it's uh, uh, basic, um, and the propaganda attempts to deceive people, um, but uh, the reality uh, is that God is outside of reality in the naturalistic framework. Do you believe that natural processes, one, are sufficient to account for major evolutionary change, two, are insufficient, or three, 
prevent major evolutionary change from occurring? Well, if natural processes means unintelligent processes, processes not guided by and driven by a pre-existing intelligence, then I agree with both two and three as you have stated them. That is to say that um, unintelligent processes are not going to produce uh, word processing programs in my computer and for the same reason they're not going to produce living things out of non-living chemicals. And um, we do know of one natural process, natural selection, which is excellent at preventing fundamental change. Uh, that. Uh, uh, because it eliminates uh, uh, the mutants, the, which are the, the overwhelming uh, majority of mutants, practically all ones, which are um, uh, either either uh, of no benefit at all to the organism or are actually harmful, will be eliminated in the end by natural selection. So um, there are processes which prevent fundamental change and that are inadequate to produce fundamental change, of course. But I want to emphasize that I'm talking about unintelligent processes. That's the term I prefer rather than natural processes. Uh, because, you know, what the Creator does could be, in a sense, natural. I don't know why it, why it isn't. Uh, 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 the, the point is that it involves intelligent direction. Doesn't the natural history of life through time demonstrate the fact of evolution? Well, um, it demonstrates that there's been a history of life through time. Uh, one can't even talk about the fact of evolution because it's such an ill-defined uh, thing. What is it? Um, the history of life through time, as we read the evidence of geology today, seems to indicate that new things appear from time to time in the history of the Earth, and old things go out of existence sometimes, not always. Some very, very ancient creatures, like bacteria, are still with us today very much as they were long ago. And even uh, animals like the horseshoe crab and the shark are so-called living fossils, and there are many of them. But in any event, some creatures become extinct, some species become extinct, and others come into existence somehow, no one knows how. They're more or less related to what went before, in that they have common features with the things that went before. And so it's reasonable to speculate that there was some possibility of development uh, that produced them. But everything that's said beyond that is just rank speculation and, and really fiction. Nobody knows how all this could have happened. What do you consider to be the best evidence for evolution? What Darwin considered to be the best evidence for what he called descent with modification in 1859 is still probably the most important evidence today. It's the pattern of classification, the similarities and dissimilarities among all living things. They virtually all have the same genetic code, but then they, they split into categories. You have human beings within the class, within the group of primates, within the mammal uh, class, uh, within uh, the vertebrate uh, subphylum, within the uh, animal kingdom, within the eukaryote, uh, the super kingdom, you might say, that um, this suggests, to a certain kind of imagination at any rate, the notion that there were common ancestors that define each group. All mammals had a common ancestor with the characteristic that defines the class of mammals and that they have inherited that characteristic. Uh, so if you think then that they had a more distant common ancestor that, uh, from which all vertebrates uh, inherited the backbone, then uh, this logically explains why these features exist, so that it makes uh, evolution or descent with modification a very attractive hypothesis, so attractive that Darwin said that it would uh, convince him that his theory was true even if all the other evidence were against him. Now, there's a flaw in this whole system, at least uh, more than one flaw, in fact. Uh, one is that uh, the hypothesis was taken to be true simply because of its logical and imaginative appeal without checking it out against the, the evidence, like the fossil evidence. It was a, a, uh, a hypothesis that was imposed upon the evidence rather than that was tested by the evidence. Now, the other thing that's uh, very interesting about this uh, view of things is that the, the features that create the classification, such as hair or fur in mammals, are called homologies. They're supposed to be inherited from a common ancestor. 
But in fact, in a great many cases, the homologies are traceable to different parts in the embryo and to different genes. Uh, so in short, the um, animals get them by an entirely different route. And this is strongly inconsistent with the common ancestry hypothesis uh, to explain them. It's also a well-known fact among uh, embryologists, but it never comes out uh, to the general public because, well, it's so unpalatable a fact and so difficult to explain on Darwinian theory. What do you consider to be the major problems with Darwinian theory? Well, there are so many, it's uh, hard to know where to start. I suppose the first place to start is with the fossil evidence. Uh, Darwin said in 1859 that he acknowledged that th that was dead against his theory, and he just had to assume the fossil record was very incomplete in order to save the theory from the otherwise devastating criticism of the fossil experts like, for example, Professor Louis Agassiz of uh, Harvard. Now, the fascinating thing is that the fossil record hasn't gotten any better in the intervening century and a third, in spite of the fact that it has been explored and interpreted by people who were practically desperate to confirm the Darwinian picture. What we found in the 1980s was that the fossil record was still characterized by two important features. One is sudden appearance. When new things appear, they appear just as they are. There's no visible history of step-by-step -step development from earlier forms. Uh, and then what, after they have appeared, they stay the same. That's called stasis in the jargon of the trade. Uh, so that once you get the shark or the horseshoe crab or anything else into existence, it stays the same throughout its tenure in Earth. There's variation within that type, but no step-by-step -step development into something different, no directional change of the Darwinian kind. And this, I might add, is not the absence of evidence. It is positively documented. Uh, so you see, the, the fossil record uh, is and remains, uh, on the whole, completely different from the picture of it you would expect from the Darwinian ideology. Now that's, I think, the, the first difficult point that you would say. Um, the second one um, is that the mechanism remains unproved um, and indeed even really disproved. By the mechanism, I'm referring to what I call in lectures the blind watchmaker thesis, which is that the random purposeless force of mutation, uh, essentially DNA copying errors, generates the creative change, and that this is then sifted and preserved by natural selection, so that you get the building up of complex organs, such as eyes and brains and hearts and livers and kidneys and all those things by this step by tiny step process of creativity and that's of course also how you get the changing of one kind of thing into something else. Um, you can see that by this theoretical process that that whole gulf in the Precambrian era where you have nothing at all between the single-celled organisms and then the animal phyla is particularly hard to explain because you have to have just a complete universe of things going in all directions down there that's been lost. Um, but any, in any event, this mechanism uh, can't be confirmed. Uh, it isn't reflected in the fossil record. Uh, it isn't reflected in the world of experiment or, or experience. Um, and and uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's a total fiction, really. I, I said in one chapter of my book that it's as, as, as invisible as supernatural creation by God. Now. Um, the third uh, a major uh, a problem, I would say, which is really related to the first two, um, is that what the Darwinians did was to take a theory that was valid at what we call the micro level. That is to say, it actually does explain how if you get, oh, say, a pair of birds that migrate to an island in the ocean and then are cut off from the mainland, and they give birth you know, to a lot of descendants through inbreeding. There's mutation. Uh, there's a certain amount of selection. Um, that you'll get variation. Finches that migrated to a, an island in the Galapagos uh, group uh, did vary and change. Um, but they're still finches. They, uh, you know, they, they got there as finches and they still are finches with variations. So the Darwinian theory explains that kind of change. 
but it was extrapolated without any justification in the evidence to explain how you get finches in the first place, how you get birds in the first place, how you get animals in the first place. And that was all just a wild extrapolation. Um, and it's, I think, really generally recognized that this is the great weak point of the theory, that it's been arbitrarily extended. Uh, so that you see, if you ask, how does uh, a bacterium become a butterfly, the answer you will get is, oh, look at those finches on the Galapagos. They changed, so the bacterium can change into a butterfly, can't it? Well, it's a ridiculous uh, uh, extrapolation if you've got a critical mind at all, but the Darwinians are committed to it because if they didn't do that, they wouldn't have an answer. And in their view, a bad answer is better than no answer at all, so that's what they give you. Darwinian theory predicts that the accumulating diversity of species should precede the disparity of the higher taxa. Isn't geological succession in systematically reverse order to Darwinian predictions? Yes, that's completely true, and it's acknowledged in such uh, books that have come to the general public as uh, Stephen Jay Gould's Wonderful Life. Uh, Gould puts it very well there. Uh, what you expect from a Darwinian point of view is a cone of increasing... Um, uh, disparity um, that it, or, or diversity. That is to say, you would start with one form of life, uh, the, the original uh, form that somehow crept out of the prebiotic soup or whatever, and then it uh, splits into two and the two into four and, and so on, so that you get constantly increasing um, a, a, a diversity in life. And uh, you should have the species first, and then when you get enough species, you can see that they can be incorporated in, into two different genera, and so on up the scale with the phyla appearing last, uh, that the phyla are the major divisions of the um, animal kingdom. Now, what you in fact get is that the phyla uh, all appear, or virtually all appear, uh, in the rocks of the Cambrian era at more or less the same time geologically speaking. So you have the basic divisions appearing first and then some of those remain until today and some of them become totally extinct but all of the diversity that you get after that point comes within the phyla. Uh, so what you have to do to uh, save the Darwinian interpretation at all is either just ignore this which is what is usually done or you imagine uh, a huge a world of a universe, really, of earlier things that have all been lost, that are all invisible, that there's no evidence that they ever existed, uh, in order to fit this within the Darwinian scheme. Um, and so it's, uh, it's really almost supernatural in a sense. It's uh, uh, invoking the invisible to uh, explain the visible because the visible in itself is totally inconsistent with your theory. Do you reject the concept of descent with modification? Well, it depends on uh, what it might mean. Um, if descent with modification means, as it meant to Darwin, that um, the process that created animals, let us say, in the first place, is the same as the process that we observe today, where great-grandparents give birth to grandparents who give birth to children, who, who, uh, who give birth to grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so on, uh, and that this process of normal reproduction where like reproduces like with small variations, uh, extended over millions of years, is the creative process that brought animals into existence in the first place. If that's what descent with modification means, then it isn't reflected in the evidence. You see, there certainly is no evidence that a bacterium by a process like this gave birth to um, the insects and the lobsters and uh, the uh, uh, worms and uh, all of those uh, phyla that uh, appear in the uh, Cambrian rocks. So I would say that descent with modification is not true if that's what it means. Now if it is simply taken to mean that there's a basis for an inference that some mysterious process of development occurred in which one thing, kind of thing grew out of another. Well, uh, I, that, that maybe is true, or maybe it's a reasonable speculation, but it's so vague that it, I think it can't be called a scientific theory. Uh, so, so that's just how I'd leave it. How all of this came about is a mystery. It appears that it did not come about 
through that tiny step by tiny step accumulation of micro changes that is the Darwinian meaning of descent with modification. Beyond that, you know, it's an unsolved mystery. Let's just call it that. It is evident from the fossil record that fundamental body plans do not undergo major evolutionary change. Are there natural processes which prevent major evolutionary change? Yes, one of them is called natural selection. You see, in fact, um, natural selection is what prevents the gradual step-by-step -step change from occurring. It's a conservative force that promotes the stasis that you uh, actually see in in, in the fossil record and in the evidence. And, and the reason for that is that um, if you try to change one kind of thing into something basically different, uh, by tiny step by tiny step, you're going through intermediate space uh, where the thing isn't viable. Uh, you can imagine this uh, in the sense of, su suppose uh, that you got a set of mutations which in themselves might be capable of turning a, a mouse into a whale. That's essentially what is deemed to have happened, according to the Darwinian theory. Not literally, because it's not literally a mouse, but um, something like that, a tiny four-legged creature, must have changed step by tiny step into a whale. But if you imagine that starting to happen, it's counterfactual because you have to imagine the mutations coming and there's no evidence that they exist, you can see that somewhere there is it start, the mouse started to develop flippers and a, a big tail and a gear for breathing underwater it had become awfully unsatisfactory as a mouse and helpless and it would get uh, eaten or would be unable to survive so natural selection would weed it out now that's simply a gross example of something that's uh, true in more subtle ways um, uh, mutations result in creatures that are not viable and natural selection stops them and so it keeps the species uh, roughly as it is with variations uh, around that stable center. If Darwinian theory is such a poor theory, why don't more scientists reject it? There are two reasons why more scientists don't reject it. One is that if they did, they would lose um, all of their prestige within science, they would never get another research grant, um, and if they didn't have academic tenure, they'd get fired. Uh, there is a system of thought control over this uh, which is extremely rigid. It's worth your professional life. That's another reason why an outsider has to be the one to challenge this. So that's reason number one. There's an enforcement mechanism. And even senior people are frightened about it and they'll tell you if you, you know, get them aside where they don't think they're being overheard. The, um, the second reason uh, is ideological. The great problem is that if Darwinism isn't true, science doesn't know what is true. You see, if the, the microevolution explanation isn't extrapolated to explain all of creation, then they don't know how it could have happened, and that's intolerable. All of the philosophers of science that are writing for the modern era have explained that um, science doesn't like to have no answer. You see, they, they will prefer to stick with a, an inadequate paradigm or general theory um, rather than to say, well, we just don't know what it is because then they, they don't have any place to start uh, uh, proposing experiments, drafting grant, uh, proposals for research grants, and so on. Uh, so, so they'll stick with the false theory if the only alternative is no theory at all, and that's the situation that they're in. Why don't scientists consider creation to be an alternative explanation of origins? Well, creation, in the sense I would be using it in answering that question, means uh, that whatever process it was that brought life or the major body plans or whatever into existence was intelligent. That is, it involved a pre-existing intelligence. Uh, so creation, in the sense, doesn't mean literal genesis or anything. It means that broader concept of a pre-existing purposeful intelligence acting to bring about the existence of life forms. That is unacceptable not because the evidence is against the proposition that it happened, but because it suggests the existence of something outside of science. You see, a science might be able to find out something about when the process happened or even how it happened, but the author of the process would be something removed uh, from the ken of science, so something couldn't be fully understood or controlled through the scientific method. 
Um, and the scientific method, as it's developed in our culture, is imperialistic. It must conquer everything. So anything that is in principle outside its purview cannot have any real existence. That's why you know, Stephen Jay Gould, in criticizing me, said, oh, science incorporates all of factual reality, you see. And that's why particle physicists like Stephen Weinberg and Stephen Hawking and, and others are proposing a theory of everything, you see because everything is within the ken of a scientific theory. And if it isn't, they refuse to recognize ex its existence. So that's why creation is simply forbidden. It's a thought crime even to mention it. If science is limited to naturalism, what possible alternatives could exist to evolutionism? Well, certainly. Uh, one of the alternatives is that the full truth about origins is simply not accessible to the kind of science that we do today. Now, to suggest that, of course, enrages um, a certain kind of scientist, although actually the majority of scientists aren't bothered by the idea at all. But the ideologues who promote things like Darwinism or theories of everything are enraged by that. Uh, but it's very much um, like uh, the experience with science in the Middle Ages, you know. The, the alchemists thought that they could make lead into g gold, and it was beyond the purview of their science. Well, uh, the same thing is that our alchemists of today think that you can take non-living chemicals and leave them alone, just stir them up in a broth, and life emerges, and then you wait long enough, you get human beings. It's, I think it's the alchemy of, uh, of today. Uh, so, so one thing we really ought to consider is that... Um, uh, the kind, at least the kind of science that we do today can't tell the full truth about origins. Um, and what our science ought to be doing is learning more about how the life forms actually work, uh, what they are, freeing themselves of the blinkers of Darwinian prejudice so that they can uh, understand more about what they are, just like the alchemists learned, needed to learn more about chemistry. They needed to learn about the difference between elements and compounds and so on before they could understand why they couldn't turn lead into gold. I think the same thing would happen if our scientists started to study the life forms without this materialist uh, set of uh, uh, blinders on and uh, they'd discover that it was something that required uh, the input of intelligence into the system uh, to be viable. Do you have any alternative research programs for scientists? Yes, I do. Um, and, and I believe that it's what scientists will be doing in the future. Obviously, scientists are not going to say, well, Johnson has proposed a research program, so let's do that. Uh, what I'm doing here is not dictating to anybody. I'm predicting the way in which I think science will develop of its own accord in the future. Uh, and what I expect to happen is this, that um, as further knowledge of uh, embryology, of molecular biology accumulates, it will become more and more difficult to deny that the processes involved are much more complex and involve many more sources of information of a very complex kind uh, than can be accounted for by the Darwinian method. Um, that uh, it's just going to become increasingly rickety as a paradigm. And I think research interest is going to then shift away from such unsolvable, for now, problems as the origin of life, let's say, or the, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, present agenda of evolutionary biology. And instead, what the researchers will be doing is concentrating on figuring out how the life processes work. And in order to do that, they're going to have to concentrate on what is the most significant thing about those processes, which is that they involve information in the same sense that the uh, programs in your home personal computer involve information, which is the product of um, in pre-existing intelligence. The agenda of biology is going to find, be to find out how that intelligence works in the living organism. And to do that, they will have to discard the Darwinian interpretation of life, which is that it's only matter evolving by natural selection. So then, of course, you're in a whole new world you'll learn a whole lot more about what life is and how it works. And at the end of that process, at some time in the future, it might be possible to formulate more intelligent questions about how things came to be the way they are, uh, which we can't even predict for now. 
Uh, just as a, to, to return to my analogy about the alchemists in the Middle Ages, once science had discarded the dream of alchemy and, and developed a different research agenda, we learned about uh, electrons and, and nucle the nuclei of atoms. We learned about what the difference between elements and compounds was. And now it's possible to imagine a way in which you might change lead into gold, you see, because uh, you know something more about uh, how th the, theoretically it might be done. Um, so uh, maybe something of the kind could happen in the future with science. But to, for science to make any progress towards that point, I think it'll have to discard the 19th century materialist ideology with which, within which it is presently confined. Darwin's extrapolations seem more metaphysical than empirical. Shouldn't scientists return to a more empirical science? Uh, yes, a return to a more empirical science implies a return to a more modest science, you see, and that's the rub. Uh, because uh, if one is going to have a science that is genuinely empirical, then it's got to admit uh, unpleasant truths, uh, such as that we don't know how fundamental change can occur or fundamental innovations can occur. You see, it's by pretending that we get the kind of answers that certain scientists want to promote to the public. Uh, so uh, I think the uh, root of the problem is, is a kind of pride, you see, a kind of arrogance. The cure is a kind of humility. And that's hard for people who are used to ruling all knowledge. The, the, the real um, example of the pride and arrogance uh, is today is not just the Darwinists. They've had a big a dose of that. But even the, those, those physicists who say we can provide a theory of everything that explains everything in principle, although it actually doesn't predict anything very much in practice. Um, you, you can see that's just simply a kind of spiritual uh, a pride at, at, at work. It's not empirical, it's not scientific at all. Do scientists need a better understanding of nature's ordinary rules of stability and stasis before they can develop better theories of change? Well, you have to understand all the theoretical mechanisms that uh, uh, govern. Sure, you, you have to understand the truth about things. You say, if there are, in fact, mechanisms of stasis, uh, like natural selection, as I think there are, you don't get anywhere by ignoring that and pretending that things are otherwise, because that makes it easier to solve the problem. You know what Darwinian biology is like? It's like the famous story of the a drunk who was found looking for his car keys under the street lamp. And the passerby asked him, well, is that where you dropped your keys? And he says, no, I dropped them over there in the bushes, but here there's light I can see. Uh, so, so, he's, so he's looking there. Well, you see, that's exactly what the Darwinists are doing. They say, well, if, things, if natural selection was an agent of change, then we could explain how things came about. That's the light. So that's where, where we'll look. Um, but the keys are over there in the bushes. Um, and uh, uh, even if there isn't any light over there, that's where eventually you're going to have to look if you're going to have any hope of finding uh, the truth. Uh, so sure, you've got to look at the things even when they're discouraging uh, in the short run, because that's the only way you're going to learn more uh, about where, where the truth is to be found. Could scientists come to the conclusion that natural processes prevent major evolutionary change? Uh, sure they could when they're acting as scientists. It's when they're acting as metaphysicians that they can't do that. You say, the, um, uh, there's nothing that prevents uh, uh, fossil experts like um, James Valentine, for example, from saying what is implied by all their work, that we just really don't know how something like the Cambrian explosion could have occurred. Um, there's nothing to prevent uh, a scientist from saying, as Stephen Jay Gould has said in writing at one time or another, um, that the mutation selection mechanism, the accumulation of micro mutations through natural selection, is not sufficient to account for genuine innovation or um, a fundamental evolutionary change. Um, and then to say, and we just don't know what could do these things. Acting as scientists, they should be saying things like that. The problem is that they are expected to be and have wanted themselves to be metaphysicians. And metaphysicians have to be able to explain those things. Um, and so they do. They may not give you true explanations, 
but they'll give you explanations. Does the California science framework allow criticism of Darwinian theory in the classroom? Not really. Um, in, in a sense, uh, you, could, you could criticize a Darwinian theory provided that you stay within the boundaries of naturalistic science. Um, there are figures like Stephen Jay Gould and Lynn Margulis who have criticized severely aspects of Darwinian theory, made all the criticisms that I have, really, in, in one form or another. But you see, they insist that they have an alternative, very vaguely specified usually, that will uh, do all of this, uh, but still keep the creator uh, out of the picture. Uh, they stay within the metaphysical boundaries of scientific naturalism. Uh, and so th up to a point that's tolerated, you say. Um, it's, it's the suggestion that maybe there's something fundamentally wrong with the metaphysics that isn't allowed. And so both at the high school and at the university level, the scientific uh, culture, the, the, the rulers of science, are determined to exclude anyone who raises those questions from the entire ambit of science. They are determined to keep the solution to those questions, where did we come from, you know, what was the creative process, within their domain, and to exclude from that domain anyone who raises the philosophical questions. And thus, uh, you know, even, even an established science professor who does that will find um, that they are the subject of disciplinary action, of boycotts of some kind, and a massive peer disapproval, which is in itself a tremendous uh, a force uh, to correct somebody and to bring them into line. Scientists tell me all the time how f afraid they are of incurring that kind of disapproval because you see in, in science, um, a peer approval is what the, the, the process is all about. That's how you get recognition, how you get research grants, how you get jobs, how you get everything uh, that the career provides. So there's that thought control enforcement and it's very effective. What can be taught legally in the science classroom? Well, that's unclear right now. Um, there's authority that even at the university level, one may not tell students that there might be something wrong with the naturalistic picture. So, uh, there actually is a Court of Appeals uh, opinion which seems to suggest that. I can't believe that that's really the law. But, the, but there is a lot of feeling among intellectuals and even among judges that academic freedom and freedom of speech stops at this issue that naturalism is sacrosanct. Really, that's what it is. It's Darwinism as a manifestation of metaphysical naturalism. And that um, freedom of speech just does not apply to this issue. Oh, in the home, it's okay, you would say. Or in church, you could say, say things. Uh, but out in public, uh, where it might make a difference, in, in the science classroom, if somebody says, well, maybe these theories of the origin of life just aren't true and things didn't happen that way at all, the axe falls, then that's when um, action is taken to make sure that students are protected from hearing a thought that might unsettle their minds, that might unsettle their certainty that naturalism is the whole truth. So um, I think this is the biggest uh, free speech uh, uh, area uh, of our culture at the moment, and I'm afraid a lot of educating of the judiciary has got to be done and of the legal profession um, to um, wake them up to this because they still think, many of them, I mean, many do understand this, but, but many uh, judges and lawyers still think that the great need is to protect the independence of science, you know, see, from some biblical dogmatism. But that is a, the issue of a century ago. Um, uh, the, the issue of today is how are we to limit the um, authoritarian uh, aspects of the scientific culture? Um, which in fact controls the educational institutions, uh, which in fact uh, is the only uh, channel of information to the elite media, uh, to the ne television networks, uh, to newspapers like the New York Times, um, and that it has such a strong, effective, authoritarian propaganda hold on the society. They're the college of cardinals in our culture that needs uh, to have its, uh, its power limited by constitutional means. Is it illegal to teach Pasteur's law of biogenesis that life does not arise spontaneously? It is illegal in the opinion of many people. I don't believe the Supreme Court's going to uphold that view in the end. 
But preliminarily, a fair number of people in the intellectual culture think that it is illegal to cast any doubt on the claim that unintelligent material processes, that's natural processes uh, in my interpretation, that unintelligent material processes were capable of doing all this creating is a dogma of the scientific naturalist faith and it may not be challenged. Because you see, it in itself is the charter of liberty in this view. It's liberty from that supernatural creator who might otherwise interfere with our freedom. And so we must not allow anybody to disagree with it in any forum where their disagreement might be effective. You see, that, that's the marginalization. We keep it outside of public uh, uh, channels. And uh, anyone that tries to challenge this will find out very quickly how many informal mechanisms there are in the media, in the educational institutions and everywhere to prevent honest disagreement on this subject from being heard. Doesn't the uncritical teaching of Darwinism undermine support for public education? Well, it does already. I think that um, a great many people are aware that a materialistic and naturalistic ideology is being promoted in the name of science. And, but, but they're helpless to do anything about it because the means of communication and the educational institutions are in the control of people who are dedicated to making that uh, propaganda. Um, so um, the science framework is really dedicated to a single end. They call it teaching more about evolution. I wish they would do that. I'm for teaching more about evolution. But that isn't what they mean. This is the usual double talk. They mean indoctrinating people in the outlook of evolutionary naturalism. They call it the scientific outlook. So what is continually to be done is evolution is to be promoted as something which is certain because the scientists believe in it. Evolution means not just gradual change, it means naturalistic philosophy. It means a purposeless material force brought about our creation. Um, and so the difficulties with the theory are to be concealed, are to be kept from the students. Uh, only the certainty that it's true is to be communicated and then they'll gradually learn more and more about it as they go along, but it's, it's a campaign of indoctrination done to promote a philosophy, really a religion in all but name, um, uh, under the guise of science. Does the uncritical teaching of Darwinism constitute the establishment of a secular religion? Yes, it does. In fact, I, one of my articles is called The Establishment of Naturalism. That's what's aimed to be done. Uh, now, this is all being done in the best of good faith by people who think it's good for us, you see, to be converted to their uh, quasi-religious ideology. Uh, their view is that that supernatural creator, God, does nothing but cause trouble. You see, it's an authority figure who, who tells us that we can't do everything that we want to do. Um, who tells us that everything isn't within our control and knowledge. You see, we don't want to have anything like that that tells us there are limits on what we uh, can do or accomplish. And so we want to get rid of that creator, and the way to do that is to convince ourselves and eventually everybody's children that we are the products of, in George Gaylord Simpson's words, a purposeless material process that cared nothing for us, that cares nothing about what we do, so, you know, it's, it's all consistent with the uh, uh, a general platform of liberation, sexual and otherwise, that is uh, so, uh, you know, deeply uh, uh, desired by many of the cultural leaders of our society. Our Focus on Origin series will continue in the future with Dr. Michael Behe, author of Darwin's Black Box, Dr. Michael Denton, author of Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, and Nature's Destiny, San Francisco State University Professor of Biology, Dean Kenyon, and co-authors of The Mystery of Life's Origin, Dr. Charles Thaxton and Walter Bradley. And now, a glimpse of things to come. It turns out that Darwin himself gave us a criterion by which we could judge whether something is explainable by, by his theory of natural selection. In The Origin, he wrote, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. 
Well, okay, what kind of a system could not be formed by numerous successive slight modifications? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, for starters, one that is what I call irreducibly complex or has the property of irreducible complexity. Let's look at another example of irreducible complexity. And this is kind of like the first one, but, uh, but significantly different. And it's called a bacterial flagellum. The bacterial flagellum is literally an outboard motor that bacteria use to swim through solution. It's a rotary device. And this is the propeller surface, and it rotates. And it's held on to the drive shaft here by this uh, universal joint uh, made up of something called hook protein. And, and the apparatus is held in place in the bacterial membrane by this stator. Uh, and the um, motor uh, is, this is a rotary motor, which is the rotating part, which turns the drive shaft, which turns the propeller. And it has to go through the bacterial membrane. So there are a number of different bushing proteins to allow it to penetrate uh, the membrane. Genetic studies have shown that over 50 different separate protein parts are required to produce a flagellum. About 20 go into making up the structure of the flagellum, flagellum and another 30 are needed to coordinate uh, the genes to turn on and off at the right time in order to build this massive structure within the bacterium. The flagellum is irreducibly complex too. If it's not for the propeller, you would not get any motion when it rotated. If it's not for the stator, uh, the, the uh, device would rotate uh, in the membrane itself. And of course, not for the motor or the bushing proteins, uh, the device would not work either. In the absence of any of those 50 different components, you do not get a flagellum that works half as well or a quarter as well again. You have a broken flagellum. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'd just like to point out that I like to use this <laughs> illustration, which is from a popular biochemistry textbook written by Voet and Voet, because when people look at this, they can immediately see that this is a machine. It's not, it's not like a machine. It is a machine. Now, there are many other examples of, of such systems which have this property of irreducible complexity and which are subsequently a, a, a strong challenge to Darwinian gradualism. 